Please be seated. Well, good evening and welcome again to our Ash Wednesday service. I am truly excited to be here in a way that I haven't been for other Ash Wednesday services for quite a long time. You see, this is not the first time, in my memory at least, that Ash Wednesday has fallen on St. Valentine's Day. Happy St. Valentine's, everyone. Uh, okay. All right. See, it happened about seven years ago. And I was all excited for it because I had worked this really good, in my own head at least, nobody knows the difference, sermon about Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday and rolled them into one. And that day, I had, uh, I had gotten a request from a local pastor who wanted to have lunch with me. And so uh, it, was, it was okay. We met in a seafood restaurant and uh, had this lunch that was very nice. And then I came back to the church and began working on all the things that I had after lunch, you know, sermon prep, all the other things for the rest of the season, all that kind of stuff. And that was when we had, had just started doing the soup suppers before our Wednesday night services. And people started to gather, and they were setting up, and they were doing all these sorts of things. And as people arrived, I started not feeling well. And I just need to say, catfish may not have been the best idea that day. <laughs> so as people are gathering, and they're all having lunch, I am, or dinner, I am not partaking. And things are getting more and more excited. There's lots of people out there. Everyone's having the soups that we've made, and it's, it's really great. And then I just got a really new vantage point on my trash can. <laughs> just suffice it to say that. And as I did this horribly unpleasant thing, I looked up from my trash can and I thought, I wonder if anybody heard me. <laughs> and then I thought, if they didn't, I wonder if I can still do the service. But I did not. I handed it over to Father Scott. He, I'm sure, did a wonderful job that night, although there was no recording, and I'm kind of suspicious about that fact. <laughs> but I, I, I'll say all that to say that I am really excited to give the second draft of that sermon. I've been waiting for this ever since that moment. And I am really excited about being able to talk about an aspect of Ash Wednesday that we almost never talk about, love, right? Because it's St. Valentine's Day. St. Valentine is the patron saint of lovers for no reason that is clear to history at all. It just kind of took over. Actually, it probably has to do with medieval British poetry if you get right down to it, but that's a different matter altogether. History has brought to us this person who is the patron saint of lovers, and everybody has been handing out little cards and candies and doing all those things and bringing flowers and all that kind of stuff to their spouse or their, or their, their boyfriend or their girlfriend or all of the kids in their classroom because that's a required thing nowadays. But I look at it in a different way, and I look at this as a wonderful parallel for what we're going into in this time. Because, you know, we're all talking about or having our, our mind set on, on the romance of St. Valentine's Day. And there is this wonderful theme that runs throughout the entire Old Testament that Paul makes very clear. All right? Romantic love reaches its pinnacle in a man and woman who are married and living their life together to the honor and glory of God. All right? That's the fulfillment of dating, of giving each other valentines, of chocolates and flowers and cards and all those things. The fulfillment is that. All right? And St. Paul, in uh, his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, he goes and talks all about husbands and wives and their marriages and how they ought to behave and husbands do this, wives do that. He goes all through that. And I'm not going to go into detail about all that. That's a sermon for a different day. But I'm going to read his conclusion. And this is from chapter 5, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 
See, God gave marriage to us so that we could have the slightest hint of how much he loves us, right? It wasn't just so that we could be happy or that we could have children. I mean, if he wanted to, he could make it so that we just sliced off a finger whenever we wanted a child. We'd be like starfish, and they'd just pop into little duplicates of us. That would be really, truly strange. <laughs> and, and, and then you'd have to decide, do I want a child or a finger? The finger will go, never mind that. But he gives us this sacrament of matrimony so that we can come together, so that we can have this experience of loving someone and sacrificing your life for them. All right? Not just calling them up when it's convenient, when you're bored, when you want to go out and watch a movie, when you want somebody to go to dinner with you. Not that. So that you can experience life together and truly give of yourselves. All right? Now, when you're, you're just in that wooing stage, when you're trying to determine whether or not this is what God's calling you to do, you know, you give the candies, you give the, the flowers, you give all those sweet things that you do when you're in that first blush of love and you're really excited about it. And then you get married, right? And then you got her, right? It's done. You don't have to worry about any of that nonsense anymore. That is absolutely false, okay? In fact, marriage counselors, all these people will tell you, you need to continue to date your spouse, right? You need to continue to woo your spouse, right? And that's why married couples all over the country are going out to dinner tonight, or they're going out for something yesterday or tomorrow or this weekend to celebrate and to continue to woo their spouse. Now, this is a great mystery, but it speaks of God in the church, okay? Because when God calls us, when we before we encounter him, before we meet him, he reaches out to us. And he draws us to him. Whether it's with a friendship, with somebody else who brings us to church, whether it's from somebody who speaks prophetically into our lives, however it is, God calls us out of darkness into his glorious kingdom. Right? He moves us to himself. And then, when we experience that love, when it changes our heart, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior and repent of our sins and are baptized, then we enter into a covenant with him. And the deal's done, right? That's it. Well, sort of. It's like marriage, you're together, right? Granted, stuff happens. People can end a marriage, but... Every time we get together, we are reminded that God will never leave us or forsake us. We can walk away with him, from him with tremendous effort, mind you, but he will never abandon us, and he is always calling us back to him so that whenever we get a little wild hair and go off in a crazy direction, he's always calling us back, always ready to receive us. Right? That's the parallel between dating and marriage. But having entered into that covenant, having gotten married, we're still called to woo our spouse. And in my mind, that's what Lent's about. It's not about doing works, prayer, almsgiving, fasting. It's not about doing those things so that we can get saved. That's not what it's about. It's not about praying and fasting and giving alms so we can check off a box and feel better about ourselves. It's about growing closer to him. 
right? That's why we date our spouses, right? We date our spouses so that we can continue to grow in knowledge and love of them, right? So that we don't have, you know, 25 years together, all the kids move out of the house and we sit across the breakfast table and look at somebody going, yeah, what now? Right? That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to continue in our relationship with our spouse. And likewise, we're con- supposed to continue deepening the relationship we have with our God. Right? And part of the way that we do this is for the very three things that we focus on in this time. And those are prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. Now, prayer is really straightforward. You want to have a good relationship with your spouse, you ought to talk to them. Right? This is, this is not even 101. This is like remedial, like 95 level. Right? This is if you want to have any... In fact, if you're not talking to your spouse, it's a giant red flag. Right? So in this season, we're called to focus our minds, focus our spirits on growing our relationship with God in prayer. As Father Melanson, the elder, pointed out recently, prayer needs to be a two-way conversation. We need to be talking to him and then listening to what he has to say. I'm sure you can imagine how awkward a relationship with your spouse would be if only one of you did the talking and the other never had a chance to say anything back. Right? There is conversation that goes on in prayer. We speak, and then we listen and give him a time to speak. And he will. Maybe not in a loud voice that, like, rattles the doors and causes all the, the uh, ceilings to rattle and all that kind of stuff, but he will speak to us. He will lead us. And he will guide us. We're called to give alms. You know, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talked about this. this is the same passage we read every Ash Wednesday. We're called to be mindful of the poor. When Jesus spoke about this issue later, he said he was going to separate the sheep from the goats. Right? He was going to separate the sheep from the goats, and these folks would have a really good time and these folks would not. And how was it that it was decided? You, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was naked, when I was sick, when I was in prison, you fed me, you gave me water, you gave me clothes, you came and visited me, you ministered to me when I was sick. You, well done, good and faithful servants, enter into your inheritance. You, who didn't depart from me. Now, we've entered into a relationship with the Lord. We know that whoever calls on his name will be saved. But if I am the one who goes first in my relationship, and I mean goes to my eternal reward, just to be clear, I don't want my wife to say, Hey, he's all right. I want her to say he was a fantastic husband. He was wonderful. He was amazing. I want her to just absolutely gush over me, even when the funeral was over. Right? Just like that. When I get to heaven, I don't want God to say, you're all right. Good job. Ish. I want to get before the throne and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And this doesn't mean that we only do this at this time. But we should be mindful of the poor because the poor are those who Christ is mindful of. We should be doing what we can and thinking about ways how we can do this. Maybe you're fasting something that costs some money. Maybe you can take that money and give it to the poor. Just an idea. But in this time, we're called to strengthen our relationship with him by caring about those people for whom he cares. If 
we're continuing this metaphor about our relationships with our spouses, maybe, and I know this is outlandish, but maybe you don't really care about football. And your spouse really does. So you watch football to be with your spouse, right? God cares about the poor. We should care about them as well. Now, finally, fasting. A lot of people have a tremendous challenge with fasting. They're like, why am I going to do something hard just to be hard on myself? Why would I do that? Well, St. Paul tells something to St. Timothy that's really, truly profound. He says, now this is 2 Timothy. This is his effective last will and testament. He says, you therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. He says, look, if you're a soldier, you don't bother with distractions. You focus on the work that your commanding officer has given you to do. Right? We in our life have so many distractions we can hardly even consider. And part of Lent, part of fasting, is putting the distractions aside. Now is this a challenge? Is this hard? Yes. In fact, if you've given up something that you partake of on a very regular basis, you might be a little grumpy. You may be a lot grumpy. It may be a struggle for you to be nice. And that struggle is okay. It's the same reason that when we go to the gym, we add weight to what we're lifting. Or we put weights around our ankles when we go for a walk or a run. All right? When I was in crew, when I was rowing, we had teams who would throw five-gallon buckets off the stern of the boat that effectively created a giant anchor for them. Why was that? Well, when we speak physically, we understand this. You do more, you make it hard on yourself so you can do better. In fact, St. Paul says this right after the last passions. And also, anyone who competes as an athletic is not crowned unless he completes according to the rules. We challenge ourselves so that when we are engaged in our normal life, we've done the above and beyond. We fast so that we put out those distractions, so that we restrict our passions. When we say, oh man, I'm really hungry. My belly is not the Lord over me. Christ is. And I am going to train myself so that I do not need to answer to my belly, but I can answer only to Christ. Now, whatever that is, my cell phone is not Lord over me. Christ is. My television shows are not Lord over me. Christ is. We train ourselves to put those things under his footstool as he reigns, so that when he calls on us to do something, we don't ever have to say, oh gosh, but I'm really hungry right now. Maybe I'll go and speak to that person after I get something to eat. Or, God forbid, you know, I'm really enjoying this television show. I'll go do the work that call Christ is calling me to do after I'm done with it. Once again, we are called to do these things to deepen our relationship with the Lord. Someone called me out recently and said, I think this is the most wonderful time of the year. I do. I'm, I'm not apologetic about it at all. Because in this time, almost everyone I know is going to be thinking, how can I deepen my relationship with God even more than I normally do? That is a wonderful thing. Look around you. All the people in this room 
are thinking, how can I grow closer to God? And that means we have allies in this struggle with us. We're not doing this alone. In a few minutes, you're going to be called up, and I will mark you with the sign of the cross with ashes. And I will say to you, remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are going to die. This is a strange thing. The world doesn't want to hear that. In fact, they go to remarkable, tremendous lengths to avoid that thought. And we embrace it. Because we know that when death comes, judgment follows. And we know that we're not judged by what we do, but by what Christ does. But again, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Not just, you were okay. And in this time, we have an opportunity to truly press in. To woo the spouse of our souls who loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for us when we were yet sinners. This is an incredible, glorious opportunity. And I pray that in the next 40 days, God speaks to your hearts and calls you into a deeper and more passionate relationship with him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.